Mr. Atul Bhatnagar, Business Advisor, Sun Moksh, India. Mr. Webhav Chauhan, Project Manager, HCL Foundation. Mr. Saurabh Chaudhary, Associate Counselor, IGBC, India. Mr. Nikhil Manohar Dubey, Associate Director, Madhya Pradesh Agency for Promotion of Information Technology, India. I'm sorry, we we'll just have to squeeze in because we have a lot of uh, speakers in the last session. Mr. Vikas Jain, AGM Produ Product Management, Delta Electronics, India. Mr. Manish Pathak, Enviropreneur, 3R Management, Private Limited, India. Mr. L. C. Sharma, Managing Director, IIRD India. Ms. Mary Helene Zara, Research Director, Center for Policies Research India. And we also have our innovators. Mr. Abhinav Goswami, Village Jarara. Mr. Abhinav Goswami. Mr. Jayaprakash Mishra, Village Lohasi. Good evening, everyone. We come to our last session for Smart Village Conclave. I welcome you all again to 5th Smart Cities India 2019 Expo. Moving to our last session. This session is on brainstorming. Brainstorming session, tools for making smart villages self-sufficient. The focus for this particular session would be housing, housing affordability, low cost housing, material selection, energy and water solutions, sanitation, reusability and recycling of waste, skill development, environmental design, disaster resilience, etc. Number two, infrastructure, construction and maintenance of roads and other forms of infrastructure, access to education and healthcare, provision of services including energy, portable water, waste and sewage management, creation of public spaces, ICT applications and operations, etc. Number three, economy, building social capital, micro and com community led finance, income generation, farming support, crop selection and improvement, market access, pricing, various forms of tourism, etc. Number four, sustainability, environmental, social and economic sustainability, etc. Last one, smart governance, ICT and data driven solutions, machine learning applications, alternative forms of governance, etc. I request ma'am to kindly start the session, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, all of you. I think you'll all have been waiting for some time now for this uh, session. The last but not the least, it's a jam-packed session with all the experts together here. Uh, so I hope I can uh, take you all through the objectives of the conference and take it to a logical conclusion. Uh, but here we're focusing on sustainability as a theme. Uh, so we have uh, experts from various domains of uh, housing, technology, uh, energy, uh, etc. And also uh, on governance and uh, clean tech solutions as well as on, uh, I think on, you'll talk of governance, right? Governance of uh, panchayats, all leading to, uh, you know, the uh, sustainability of our rural uh, areas. Not really, the, I wouldn't go by the cliched sustainable development goals, but our own uh, measures of sustainability. So uh, so we start with, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, Saurav says he has a flight at 8.15. Is anybody else constrained for time? Then I, 
if you permit me, I start with Saurav. Is that OK? Uh, OK. So Saurav, uh, we would like to hear from you about the green rating of villages that you have started as a big initiative. Yeah. Hello. So uh, I'm Saurav from Indian Green Building Council. Uh, Indian Green Building Council was set up in 2001 as part of CII under the initiative uh, of having more of uh, greener buildings in the country. So from 2001 onwards till today, we have more than 5,200 projects. But now talking about villages, we started this initiative two to three years back, where the idea was uh, if there can be a rating program, it becomes a uh, tool for anybody to uh, adopt that rating and then select and do not miss any of the activities which, we, which can lead to a greener development. Like in buildings, we, the learning was it can be uh, energy, water, materials, and others. So when we started doing the development, we started uh, working with many of the villages which were already operational in the country, all villages which were there, and uh, we talked with Sarpach. So first village which was uh, we did was Maulindong village, which was in Meghalaya, where we understood that how a community has made this a, this is an ecotourism spot by following the principles which was there in that village since long. So if, uh, what we defined as a green village, uh, as part of IGBC, I'll just tell that, a green village is one which offers access to clean energy. Here, uh, the point is access, because we are not addressing efficiency in villages. We are first addressing the accessibility. Similarly, adequate water, adequacy we are addressing. There may be water, water infrastructure, but there may not be adequacy, because people are uh, traveling miles with a pot uh, and uh, still uh, having the shortage of water in many of the villages, basic education, good health care, hygienic sanitation. If we talk about these, these are very, uh, everybody talks about it, right? What is new in Green Village Initiative that we are doing differently? So uh, that's what we did. We have uh, developed this rating program and divided it into uh, 40 to 50 criteria under five modules. These five modules that we have was, uh, one is on health and hygiene, one is on uh, energy availability, one is on water efficiency and uh, water infrastructure, one is village infrastructure, one is on uh, social and community actions, how this uh, uh, idea was also that as part of social and community actions is that it should become a replication for, uh, model for many of the villages which are there in the country where uh, many of these aspects are not there. So we started with some of the villages where most of it is there and this tried, uh, and based on the implementation scoring was given out of 100. So uh, pre presently, to we have around uh, uh, 24 villages which are already rated in the country. So these are in different states. Our idea was also that uh, if we can create one village in one state, at least that will be the starting point. Future, we can have 1,000 model villages in the country which can reach out to 6 like 40,000 villages and the ideas can be adopted. The same, uh, because we believed in the concept in IGBC that first we practice and then we preach. The same idea was successful in the building sector, so we uh, adopted the same idea that let us uh, make some model villages, and when somebody goes to those kind of villages, they start learning a lot of practices. Example like Ralegan Siddhi, that is actually a uh, national watershed uh, training center, where many of the villages have learned on the rainwater harvesting. The story of a drought-prone village to a uh, wat uh, water scare, uh, with a huge water availability, presently 1.83 crore liters of water is available with various uh, check dams and this which they developed themselves with Shamdan. So uh, similarly, one of the village was Baligao in Assam, which has achieved the award of Eastern Himalayan Botanica Award because the Sarpanch himself is known aware about all the plant species which are there in the village and every plant, its root, its stem, its leaves, everything is getting useful for either lungs or different, different uh, things. So, uh, so there are some villages where people can learn. So we, uh, uh, we went ahead and we did some villages, like we started the Pilpat village, which was the Sansad Adash Gram Yojana, first village in Haryana that was rated. Apart from this, if I talk about CSR, because the last session was on CSR, CSR, uh, some of the villages were, uh, has done ex ex uh, phenomenal job, like Bhund village, which is in Mewad district. Feedback Infra has worked on that village. And that was 2014 when the village was like, there was no, no children going to the school. There was a uh, lot of issues which we talked about in the last sessions. So uh, that village has been completely transformed and today it has achieved platinum rating. It was gold rating when they achieved in 2017. Uh, and to, after two years the, with the continuous impl implementation, we can see the progress. I should say this is the success story of IGBC because a village has been completely improving based on a rating tool. So that rating tool, we want to give it to everybody who, want, who is interested to do CSR so that we don't just uh, uh, do a telemedicine or do a uh, simple education, uh, um, uh, some school and then stop.
because there is a potential that we continuously engage with that village for the lifetime and that uh, act, village can be completely transformed. The villages and the, we have very good success stories where we have seen that uh, the children who were uh, given various skills and they started uh, opening a wheel alignment uh, shop. Somebody has started, uh, uh, some of the training institutions have got more than 20 to 30 people enrolled in different government uh, offices as jobs. So uh, these are various success stories which we have. Uh, and what we also did as part of this initiative is that we choose some villages, like uh, Sachin Tandulkar has adopted a village, which is in Andhra Pradesh, that's uh, Puttamraju Kandrika. That village is also rated by us. Then Mahesh Babu, the actor from uh, Telugu industry, his village, which he has adopted, is also rated by us. Our idea is that if somebody does a good job, may it be a celebrity or anybody, that kind of idea has to be encouraged also. And then finally, we can see hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, sports persons, celebrities, also doing their bit for the nation. And then finally, these villages can be uplifted. So that is the uh, uh, whole story that IGBC can right. share. Uh, right. Sort of, but uh, what is the incentive? Like, for example, if she's she's from, uh, uh, you know, she's a Pradhan. So if yeah. she wants to get her village IGBC green rated, what are the you know charges or you know it's come to brass tax and yeah. what does she gain from it? Yeah, I would I would say that uh, this is a rating tool. First, uh, first of all, uh, wherever there is a CSR opportunity, the cost yeah. which IGBC uh, incurs for this rating system is nothing because we uh, we incur our own cost for the travel and other things. It's a very nominal cost that we charge because we have to, uh, at least because it's a dot for profit body, CII, we have to bear the minimum expenses of coming, going, and, uh, and finally awarding the uh, village. What they get out of it is that basically that becomes a model village. It can generate a lot of eco tourism potential. A lot of uh, one of the village has uh, been, uh, we have also rated Puttambakam in Tamil Nadu is rated by us. That is actually utilized for many of the film stu shootings in that village. So if we see village is only bad and there's nothing there, we'll not be able to look at the positive side of it. There's a lot of positive side of it, rather than saying that no education, no literacy, but that village is able to uh, give that village many of the parts for doing shootings because they need to sh uh, shoot that rural areas also. There is examples where one of the village uh, which we were working has started creating that uh, open, uh, that is open defecation free village. So they have uh, created their own uh, that, uh, septic tanks. Construction is completely happening by the youth in the uh, village. So this kind of uh, ideas can be just uh, 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 shared by the CSR and the, by the various corporates. These can at, at least um, make the village self-sufficient in long run. And there are many such ideas where many of the startups are also coming up with newer ideas. So uh, here we can see each uh, village, if can be linked up with one corporate, the, uh, all the Indian villages can be converted to a very model and world class villages. It also and helps the village to attract more investments and yes, all that. Yes, and right? it will Private attract sector. a lot of investments because once we see, uh, well, I would share an example which is not uh, specific to village, but there is a green railway station that we are also working. So Sikandrabad station has been rated. Uh, Honorable Minister has received the award for Sikandrabad station. And after that, recently, Malaysia government and different other governments are also looking at that, that uh, specific station. What is happens when something achievement is done, everybody starts to also encourage them to do more. So sustainability is actually is a uh, very good magnet, I would say. So when, but sustainability, if you define yourself, it will not be a magnet. But if it is, uh, it is defined by somebody which is a certifying body who is not, nothing to do from your, from your village, and they rate your village, means your village has something great. So people will start looking at your village, then investments, funds, development, these are all the next steps which will follow. It also comes under the UN SDG uh, umbrella? Uh, yeah. Uh, if we look at the UN SDG, the World Green Building Council, which is the parent body for the Indian Green Building Council, they have aligned the, all the activities the Indi uh, Green Building Councils across the world are doing as part of the SDGs. So what is happening? They are presenting on behalf of all the inter international Green Building Councils in the world in the building stay on the Paris Agreement. Okay. So we are all aligned with the SDGs, though we are not highlighting specifically in the rating system as what is water energy and sure. specifically. But uh, when we presented about Green Village recently, the international conference in last year, so we had the World GBC chair and CEO also in India to talk about, and, uh, about the Green Building movement in the world. So they were shocked to see the uh, villages taking the award at that event. So what happens, a green village is not a very big concept outside. Right. But India can demonstrate a world-class uh, uh, concept on green village, that how the green villages, where there is nothing to do with the air conditioning systems or the technologies, but still it is green, 
in its Indian traditional way, Indian uh, um, the way that our grandfathers and grandmothers used to work. Uh, th that concept can be encouraged, and that is also only encouraging the green building rating. People should not think that green village rating is means a lot of investments. It will not bring in a lot of investments, but it will bring in a culture which will be uh, forward looking and which will look at alternative livelihood options. So after the adopting this rating, some of the villages, uh, there are uh, many alternative livelihood options have come up. Uh, women empowerment has happened. The best example would be Bhund actually, where uh, Feedback has done a phenomenal job. Now Renew Power is working with one of the village in Paniara, Varanasi, that is a uh, prime minister's constituency, that uh, village. Uh, Paniara is going for that green rating. Then we, apart from this, we are working with many others. Uh, ICICI has adopted one village. So like this, uh, people are trying to demonstrate one village in every state. And then future, we should look at sure. all the 640 districts have one village so that that will become the model in Maybe every district. 250,000 gram for yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks, Aurav. It was very interesting. I don't think everybody knows that there's a green rating for villages as well. So it was an eye-opener. Thank you very much. If you want to leave, you can, uh, you can stay whenever you want. So, uh, shall we go to you, Mary, or would you want to make a presentation or, uh, okay. So, Mary is actually Research Director, Center for Policy Research, and uh, she's a Senior Visiting Fellow at the Center for Policy Research, and there's also a Research Director with the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, and a member of SESMA Paris, and she would like to talk about a success stories in your experiment with uh, energy transition in rural areas. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, in fact, I'm a bit of an odd one out here since I'm a pure academic researcher. So actually, the two things I think I'm going to maybe talk about is uh, maybe a way to ask questions to uh, uh, the other members of the panel who I think are doing much more operational uh, work. So uh, the things that I've been doing recently is uh, to work on an international research program that looks at energy transition and a hybrid system. And therefore, to look, speci specifically, I'm looking a little bit at the deployment of solar energy uh, in small towns and in, you know, rather urbanized villages, because I'm working ar in Ariana. So, I mean, as you all know, Ariana is actually highly urbanized. But it's very clear that uh, there is a deployment of solar. I mean, it's not as uh, fast as one would expect it. But uh, there are pioneers within villages that always you can see there's a kind of peer group effect that is very important. And once uh, one or two persons start installing, it has a rolling effect. And uh, this is very interesting to study. So I guess if one starts to think of uh, energy solutions based on solar, one has to most probably think of identifying uh, those pioneers. I mean, I don't know whether pioneers is the right term, but I think there are people who can have a peer effect on others. And uh, so this is very clear because they do benefit from uh, lower uh, energy costs. They find that they can use energy in a much uh, better adapted way to their uses, especially for the women during the daytime. So it's much better for them. So I, my only two things, because I look at it from a longer perspective, I'm a researcher, and my, uh, there are a few questions, of course, around this transition. One thing is that I think India has the ability to leapfrog, and we hear this a lot when we talk about uh, transition, whether it's uh, smart solutions or even non-smart solution. But leapfrogging often happens uh, that there are coexistence of system. And uh, in Ariana, it's very interesting because those who started to develop solar in the villages uh, did it just before uh, there was a big scheme that really increased the power supply in the villages. So now in many villages in Ariana, the Haryana uh, Electricity Board, North and South, has uh, actually increased its uh, ability to provide services. So suddenly you get 18 hours of electricity, while three, four years ago you did not have three, four hours of electricity. So those who have used so uh, invested in solar, they've kept it, but the investments have totally stopped. So I think it's very important when we think of transition, of how we think of that moment when you know, system coexist. And I think one tend to sometimes think that a system will replace another. And technology doesn't replace necessarily another. They are often coexistence of technology. So, I mean, mostly I want to ask questions to the panel. How do you think of this when you devise solutions or you're thinking of how you do it? And so this is really a question of temporality and how do you imagine uh, different uh, time zones for different technology? My, my sec second questions I have when I'm going on the field is, it's very fascinating to see, uh, and I find this extremely fascinating, is the inventiveness, if you want, of small providers. 
in every village around the small towns, you have people who are going to provide solutions, solar solutions, right? And there's a thriving market. Uh, it's very fascinating to study this market. Here, I've been going around waiting for the panel to start, and uh, we have mostly big companies. But actually, the solar market in rural areas is driven by very small players. And these very small players are very fascinating to study. But I think there is behind it a question of regulation and long-term sustainability of these systems. Because today, I'm happy I've put a solar system, but uh, it's be, most of the time, it's below five years. I've not used it for more than three or four years. Now, what will happen in seven, eight, nine, ten years when you know there might be some uh, big rains, or which will spoil my panels, or there will be some maintenance. So I think there's also, uh, I would like to ask, actually I'm sorry, I'm asking questions more than, uh, <laughs> but I want to know how do you think of your long-term sustainability? It's the same with the rating. You were talking of rating. I'm rating the village today, but how do I maintain my rating over the years? How do I do that? I mean, today I might be declared the best village in, uh, I don't know, Arunachal Pradesh or wherever. But I'm saying, what about tomorrow? So, I, I mean, my two things of how do we think of coexistence of different system when we think of transition, and uh, how do we think of regulating a very, very vibrant market? Around energy, it's very clear, it's very vibrant, very inventive, but we need to put in place systematic uh, solutions to make sure that this, p this system remains sustainable. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if I may answer the first question as to how do you make all kinds of energy is relevant. Uh, one uh, way would be to have a policy of renewable, ben renewable energy where you have a mix. You say this much percentage of India's energy should come from solar, this much should come from coal, this much should come from nuclear. Maybe if you really follow that policy, that could be one way out. And the other questions perhaps you can answer about ratings, how they could be sustainable across. Ratings, actually, uh, the idea of rating is itself that it should be dynamic. Uh, so the ratings, what we do, we uh, keep in touch with the projects which uh, go for the rating. So villages, they keep on improving. And it is actually, they have a scorecard in front of them, 100. If they achieve 60, they will try for the 70 next time or 80 next time. So the idea is that whenever there is a scoreboard, it should keep on ticking. Otherwise, people, uh, that, that's the culture that in India people love because people love cricket in India a lot. The same thing here also we get like a scoreboard scoreboard so they keep on uh, improving they discuss with the csr partner whether these things are possible so we do visits and do the assessments thank you right i think all sarpanches and pradhans they like the seven stars uh, you know on their uh, cap so we'll go. so anybody else would like to answer some of her questions about uh, how to keep different forms of energy relevant in india and how do you regulate the markets perhaps that question is unanswered yeah. So, uh, I would like to speak about the technology coexistence and so our, uh, at HCL Foundation, we, uh, with, with solar in particular, so we are working with microgrids. So, what we have thought out that these uh, microgrids are somewhat we think better than uh, the uh, household level systems because a lot of irregularities in supply can be managed when a few households are able to come together and create that sort of a grid. So technology wise and that system also becomes such that it can feed back power to the uh, grid and hence coexist. Yeah. So uh, that is uh, something that uh, we work on. On the markets, I'm, um, I also am very clueless but at they, that there is a uh, natural pros process by which markets uh, evolve. Once we have these small players and if the market is big enough, somebody will come and consolidate all this and some uh, corporate would see it as an opportunity and bring in their products and uh, even out of the field or bring in these systems which are better. So it, I think market is more of a, uh, a evolution process that feel. happens. Market yeah. is a self-regulator. Self, it's not self-regulated. Some, some things, so the bad effects of the market, so the, the basic economic theory, the, all the bad effects of the market needs to be re regulated by the government. But what she's asking about is evolu evolution of the market. How would it be consolidated? That right. is a if, that is a evolution process that gets that becomes when when the market is big enough, there would be players who would be who would bring standardization and better products and standardize better services uh, to that. 
Sure. Uh, so to continue this theme of technologies, maybe I'll invite Manish to speak. He uh, calls himself an enviropreneur, which is he has some disruptive thoughts on how our rural areas should be planned and how environmental sustainability can be ensured. Manish, a yeah. few thoughts thank, from you. Thank you, Vinita. Uh, see, actually, uh, I was just going through last two sessions also, and uh, some questions that are being uh, raised by Murray also and is being discussed. We are talking about sustainability. So the basic question whenever we think about sustainability comes to my mind is that either the moment we think about smart villages or smart cities, our approach has been to provide uh, painkillers. So there are two aspects, painkiller or vitamins. So I might be in a pain. I have been to some villages in Rajasthan. Some foundation came, they provided a lot of uh, infrastructure for uh, clean drinking water. So there was an um, overhead tank and then there were a few water ATMs, but what happened after two years? Nothing was working, not because the system was not working, but because there was no groundwater available. So what we tried to do was, we tried to just focus on the painkiller aspect. We did not think that for a healthy body, some amount of sunlight is needed, some amount of nutrients and vitamins is needed, and which might impact after five years, six years, seven years. So any kind of rating that happens, that happens from the perspective of what is there today. Whenever some agency goes CSR or some government agency, they are bound by some rules that within one year I have to show some result. As a manager of a CSR fund, you have to show, okay, I have adopted a village. What I will show after one year, after two years? So naturally what you try to do is you try to find some painkiller. And you just pat your back. Okay, fantastic, you did it. Water available for all, everybody in the village. But what happens to the... And all these things is more aligned to individual positions. It might be toilets, it might be solar, microgrids. But what about the community position? What about the groundwater of the village? What about the environmental aspect of the village? So if you talk about sustainability of a village, the perspective has to change. Because villages are going to stay, people are living there. And it is very easy to get into that trap of individual position, get one, uh, one uh, uh, solar panel, get one uh, toilet, get anything that is available from the government. And Though these things add value to it, but it is not going to make it sustainable. This just tries to make them at par with whatever people are getting in the urban areas. Sustainability, whenever thing, there are there must be two aspects. One is environmental sustainability, one is financial sustainability. And for environmental sustainability, what is the groundwater level today? What it can be five years down the line, ten years down the line, fifty years down the line, this needs to be taken care of. In village, one thing we have seen is that whenever people go and talk about Individually, something very has to do it, as Maria already told, that the this uh, leapfrog effect. So we try to get into that. Okay, I also have to get it done because some Sharma ji got it, so Verma ji will also get it. But the moment we talk about that, every villages in India used to have two rivers, sorry, two ponds, one for animal, one for uh, human. Where all those ponds went? Sixty percent of ponds, water bodies of villages are gone, vanished. I have been working on this. I lead a group which is basically working on collection of water bodies data. 60% they don't even know. The district administration doesn't know where all are our water bodies. So what are we trying to do? There is no water body in my village. My mom called me day for yesterday that, okay, we need a new submersible because there is no water. So in Bihar, there are governments who are doing this. In Bihar, there is a Nishche program. So every body, every hill villages should have a piped water connection. Fantastic, piped water connection. But from where you get the water if there is no groundwater? And you cannot keep just extracting the water without thinking about water sustainability. What are you trying to do about the... Uh, it's the same thing like, you know, uh, we have uh, agri. So just keep putting all the urea and chemical and finally you start thinking about, okay, my production has grown and everything is good. But nobody is thinking about sustainability. You will get all the kind of ratings. Punjab, most performing agri community. But what are we doing? And there is the problem, dilemma of managers of CSR funds, because they have, they have to get rating after a year, right? Some boss is going to tell them, okay, what's your performance level? Sir, this village, every, all the house is getting water. But if I question, how many years you planned it for? Now that was not my area of concern. My area was only to provide this. So this is one aspect. Second aspect, when we talk about the rural economic sustainability. Earlier there used to be a word, kheti badi. People from villages will understand. Kheti and badi was used in conjunction. Kheti was agriculture, which might fail one year. But badi was something which women of the house used to carry. 
सम बकरियाँ सम कुछ बकरी पालना भेड़ पालना मुर्गे पाल लेना कुछ छोटी सी खेती कर लेना घर के आसपास ना व्हाट हैपन शी हैज़ बीन टू हरियाणा इट इज़ अ कॉन्क्रेटाइजेशन कॉन्क्रीट के पूरे गांव बना देने हैं हमें एंड बाड़ी हैज़ डिसअपियर्ड बाड़ी वॉज समथिंग विच यूज टू सस्टेन द हाउस एंड फैमिली इन द वर्स्ट केस ऑफ अ ड्रॉट और समथिंग हैपन्स ऑफ द एग्री फेल्यूर हैपन्स नाउ बाड़ी कॉन्सेप्ट इज गॉन सो एंड बट बाड़ी वॉज नॉट समथिंग इट वॉज इंडिविजुअल इट वॉज बेसिकली जो सोसाइटी वी यूज टू just uh, encourage it so kheti badi has gone so the moment agri goes out we start hearing all this uh, suicide by farmers and agrarian crisis and all these kind of words no government has any means to basically solve it until and unless we just take down the good practices that has been there from ages and it was for making sustainable so villages were generally sustainable what we did was most of the times we just go with our own experimentative eyes and just to try to do something and we try to do something we we just change their behavior they start expecting everything from the government or some social agencies rather than making them feel that okay you are the owner you can change it and this is what you have been doing we are here to learn from you what we can do is probably we think that we have better technology to tell you some forecasting thing so we can be of help to you there so so this is something there are two points and uh, most of the cases whenever i attend such kind of sessions i don't find lot of discussion around it our myopic view is up to 5 years like the government's basically run for 5 years today is right moment that at least we have five more years for the government and this we have seen while you are working in the urban mission so nothing happens in mission mode everybody is trying to run their day to day job and doing this sometimes we sitting in this panel try to destroy the very fabric very uh, the essential property of a village which is naturally sustainable that's why it was a village it was sustainable in any kind of system so it will be a longer discussion but from these two perspective i told you there was a social sustainability also we can discuss some other time but these two things are there for policy makers for um, foundations and csr people and for researchers also to view that uh, i can encourage you by giving some candy rating but the sustainability factor is not there then basically what i'm trying to do i'm trying to basically uh, creating a bigger issue larger issue tomorrow and you will feel hopeless after 5 years yeah. everything is there but there is no water and now by that time you have forgot about it that i have to maintain my pond my water bodies right. which was earlier used to be maintained by them plantation was there mm. if somebody dies in the villages plant two trees now planting trees is not my job one vibhag will come and do it why so such kind of things needs to be taken care and this is what i have found with my experience in trying to work with villages especially in the water body sector so basically restoring old uh, i mean traditions as well in terms of you know ponds and basic uh, Correct, infrastructure yeah. as well as culture and that's what you're saying right yeah. that's also an element of sustainability exactly yeah. it should be part of the planning and part yeah, of so thinking sustainable such state. ratings yes. and some points for you know uh, rest restoration of uh, core elements of the villages Uh, atul ji i would like to go to you i think he's quite a passionate uh, in, in clean tech uh, solution person and he was a ceo of nsdc and he quit all that to start sun moksha so would you like to say something about sun moksha and the experiment pilot initiative that you have done sir sure um, instead of just talking i just want to play a the short video, video. Uh, excuse me excuse me can i get a small video played please I think till they play, you can start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Sun Moksha is, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Let's just see the video, and I'll I'll explain after. Okay. Yeah, we can see the video. Cutting off its 600 residents from the developed world, most people here are farmers. They still follow a traditional way of life, but things are changing. For the first time, Chotki's residents have access to electricity provided by this 30 kilowatt solar power plant set up earlier this year. It's part of a green technology project, the brainchild of social entrepreneur Ashok Das. We had given them 200 watts. What's happened to the video? Electricity grid. Cutting off its 600 residents from the developed world. Most people here are farmers. They still follow a traditional way of life. But things are changing. That was 
use it. Okay. okay. Uh, just wanted to explain here that by providing consistent, reliable energy to this village, a lot of new f things have come up. So sustainability itself is governed by having to provide that energy. It's like saying, what do I need to get out of bed first? You need energy, that's it. So that's what you have done here. And in terms of, I mean, uh, you talked about microgrids. So we have made it smart microgrids. So it's not about just providing electricity and providing some devices, et cetera. How do I monitor and control? And not only us from sitting in an urban situation, how do the villagers themselves govern their own selves? And this is the latest technology, there are IoT devices. This has been running for the last three years. It's not something that's a desktop solution or recently done. And the villagers themselves have found their own means. They have somebody opened a, a photocopier shop, somebody has opened a retail shop for the late night, the uh, street cities have come out. So the things that we're trying to do differently is one, make it smart microgrid, so you know how much you're producing, where, and the same, it, it allows dynamic demand supply management. So in the morning, the, uh, the electricity is more for the uh, uh, irrigation in the, in the uh, farm. In the night, it comes to the houses. It's, second, it's empowering the villagers. They decide, we don't decide what the tariff is going to be. They decide what the expenses are. They decide what uh, the revenue is going to be. And accordingly, the tariff is decided. The module itself has uh, a billing and payment uh, for, um, a facility by which each villager knows if you haven't paid, you don't get electricity, that's it. So everything is pointing towards earn your money, be sustainable, and grow. S second, we're not talking of only home solutions. Because again, home solutions, if you provide 24-7, well, you'll buy two fridges and two TVs and go to sleep. But that doesn't do anything to your economic thing. So we are not looking at entitlement, we're looking at empowerment. So can we provide that electricity to, uh, let's say, a cold room in that village? And let the villagers, not uh, the farmers, produce something and freeze it there and sell when the Monday price is right. So again, it's a facility by which you can grow and, and grow more. Now, in terms of water, I'm glad you brought that up. Instead of just providing bore wells to everybody and everybody drawing on the water that's there under the ground, we have now come up with a solution called the Smart Aquanet, which is one person who becomes a water entrepreneur. He, he's like saying, let's imagine a 30 hectare uh, plot in the 45 farmers having small, medium, large kind of stuff. One guy says, okay, I'm, I'm near this pond or I'm near this water source or I have the money to in invest in a big bow well. I take the responsibility of doing this. And then each land is kind of measured in terms of its water content, its, the crop that is required, the, the health, uh, the whatever the uh, what the weather pr predictions, etc., and they decide how much water is required for each. Now imagine this guy goes across with a with a kind of a fire hose pipe and stands in that particular place. Everything is pre-programmed. You need 10,000 liters, 10,000 liters come. You need 15,000 liters, 15,000. It's not supposed to be at nine in the morning. It can be nine, ten, three afternoon, whatever. So it's not that everybody needs water at the same time. So one water source. You're preserving the water, providing the right amount of water at the right time, at the right place, for the right price. And now along with water, we are pro uh, providing liquid fertilizers, organic ones. That goes to the root of the plant itself, so the crop that's been grown there. So again, it's not sprinkling fertilizers and poisoning the land. The effectiveness is like 15 to 17%. If you do it right at the place, it's 90%. And if you preserve water, then you can do multi-cropping. You don't have to be dependent on monsoons and whatever it is. So we are looking at water conservation. That we, we start with. Second, we get on to this. So that's a smart aquanator as a product. Then the smart nanogrid, which provides uh, this demand de supply management of, of electricity. And then all of this culminates into a smart economic zone. So you can have food processing. You, when you have a cold room, you can pro uh, take milk and make cheese out of it, paneer out of it, do value addition as source. Women get empowered, they can do start uh, doing this. This entire microgrid can actually be uh, done by women. You don't need high five people sitting there. And uh, I'm, unfortunately, this particular video didn't play, but it kind of shows that there are eight plus guys working with IoT devices. 
for the last three years, we have not stepped into that world. Now comes the, uh, the, um, the question of policy. I mean, we, we talked about these technologies. Unfortunately, solar power is working like solo power. I mean, you know, it's like solar solutions on top of uh, houses. They put up the stuff, works for three year, months, and when it goes bad, you don't even know where to get the person from. Whereas with a microgrid and with smart microgrid, you can actually predict failure, if at all, that is. Or you can predict preventive maintenance to prevent the failure from coming through. Then you have analytics to show what power and what, how much usage and what is affecting a particular device on the way itself. Now, in terms of policy, there's no policy for smart microgrid. Smart so, microgrid. So, and even if you were to look at this holistic development of a village, who will design this policy? Is it rural electrification, mm -hmm. or is it going to be rural development, or is it going to be renewable energy, right. or which department of the ministry, or what particular ministry is going to take this up? Second, this very village that I was, I mean, you showed the initial part. It's a microgrid. It's in the middle of an elephant reserve. Electricity would have never reached there because the elephants would die. But one fine day, one MPN comes and says, oh, you don't electricity, we do it. So now the grid electricity is being provided. So the person who set up the microgrid is not going to make any more money. The money has gone waste. So unless there's a policy to say there's these remote areas, smart microgrids work, here there will be electricity working, here there will be solar back with goba gas, somewhere the wind will back with uh, uh, electricity itself. Hybrid of sources, basically. Sure, Hybrid of so sources is what we need. So we need water conservation, we need policy backup, and we need smartness in our solutions in order to get that right. right. And just to, I mean, the person who does it all is Ashok Das, he's sitting there. All technical questions will be asked by him, sir. Okay, so basically you're making the point through your case study that technology, uh, providing technology, IoT solutions actually uh, kind of ensure sustainability of technologies, right? Yeah, yeah, basically you, once you have a handle on what is the power being generated, how it's being generated, yeah. and, all yeah. of that can be done together. Right. It cuts down the capital expense. Right, right. You can, you know, you can water 10 fields at 9 o'clock, you can water 15 different fields at 12 o'clock and water 12 fields at sure. 3 o'clock. You don't have to water 25 fields at the same right, time. Right, right. And I think we Indians are quite good at using technology. It seems like even in rural areas, mobile apps and things like that, people are taking to it easily. So I think that's a exactly. good way that of... Exactly. That uh, is yeah. what... So we are empowering the villagers and, and very frankly sitting from here right. and looking at these villages in Nodisa, they get the same picture as we do. So sure. actually we don't add any value, very frankly. Right. They can do it themselves. So taking forward this theme of IT and uh, you know technology, maybe Nikhil, would you want to say something about uh, how you've integrated IT with various development solutions? Okay. Uh, so in the morning, uh, my director was here and she spoke about the organization. So I won't I won't talk about Map IT, uh, but like briefly, it so we provide services to the departments of the government of Madhya Pradesh, various departments, uh, and IT-based services precisely. Uh, I specialize in blockchain, per se, and the technology is new. So before I move forward, uh, just want to set the context right for you all. Um, the idea of ICT emanated like during the good governance debate. Uh, transparency, accountability, and participation, all of, the, all of those were considered as pillars of good governance. And technology was considered as a catalyst that could bring about that sort of transparency. And now we are in a stage where we can say that it's ICD 2.0. And if the states miss this bus, uh, you know, this is like a bus. And this, if the states miss this bus, uh, they'll, they'll lag behind uh, drastically compared to other states which have not missed this bus. So blockchain, what is blockchain? Uh, there was this uh, hula balu about bitcoins uh, like a couple of years back. Uh, I'm sure you might have heard about that. And so people started using uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, all of that synonymously. And so I want to just clear that out. Uh, so blockchain is the platform on which Bitcoin was based. So blockchain is nothing but it's a database management system. It's how you, you, how you store your data. That is what blockchain is. That is what blockchain does. And data, as we all know, is, is the new god. So if you do not have access to data, if you do not have control over your data, um, then you cannot make sound policies. And uh, 
and states are realizing that, uh, like recently the states have been realizing that. So Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, all these states have been increasingly like investing in data analytics technologies and blockchain is one of them. So uh, what can it do basically? So we are here like smart villages and I think smart villages would require smart governance. Um, and smart governance would be that governance where we do not miss out on patterns, where we learn from our mistakes, um, where we make policies which are sustainable of course, but we do not repeat the same mistakes we made like uh, during our previous policy uh, experiences. And coming back to the blockchain, so MP is right now investing in uh, like multiple departments which are connected to rural development precisely. So our idea is to start with the Department of Revenue. And the major problem we have uh, right now is like people do not know if their land is undisputed. So most of the disputes in India are regarding land. Uh, most of the cases in courts are regarding land and they're land-based disputes. So we do not have the system of conclusive titling. And when you do not have the system of conclusive uh, titling, now imagine in a system where like money lenders are prevalent, where banks do not give you loans if you do not have a conclusive title. How, do you, how can you like ensure that farmers' income could be raised? So uh, we start with revenue. Uh, so we are creating a blockchain. We are storing data there. And what blockchain does is, once you store the data, it cannot be tampered. It cannot be hacked. It cannot be changed. So once I ensure that a certain, for example, it's your land, and I store that, that data there, the area, the size of the land, the shape of the land, the owner, all of the data is, one, is stored. And that cannot be tampered with. And it will stay in the blockchain forever. And then I can connect that blockchain with multiple stakeholders. So the same, um, the same data could be shared to the registration agency. So when the same owner goes to the registration agency for the registration of his title, there won't be any problem in figuring out whether the land is disputed or not. Imagine it's a farmer's land. I, I'm coming back to agriculture and smart villages, raising farmer's income. The farmer's land, the, there would be data on soil health. There'd be data on what kind of fertilizers have been used in the past, what kind of crops have been grown. And I have all of that data on blockchain. Blo blockchain makes data shareability easy. So I start sharing that data to corporates. And for example, uh, McDonald's wants to procure 1,000 kg of potatoes for its french fries. And it figures out that these are the farmers whose lands are suitable for the cultivation of potatoes. And Jandhan Aadhaar and Mobile, the trinity the government is banking on currently, is also there on the blockchain. So the government, what it does is, it shares the farmer's detail to the corporates. And the companies directly contact the farmer, and the farmer is like, okay, fine, like, I, can, I can supply 1,000 kgs of potatoes to you. Uh, what you do is like, take my bank account and supply the money to me. So that's, that's their relation, and you eliminate the middleman that way. So yeah, I mean, this is one application. There's application in, there's application in multiple departments as well. Um, and that is what we are trying to do uh, when, we, when we say that we have to be smart when it comes to governance. Otherwise, the pending cases in the courts won't let us govern. Uh, so thank you so much. Sure. Thanks uh, so much, Nikhil. Uh, so is blockchain, are we as a country uh, mature enough to scale up blockchain to a large extent now? Yeah, so, um, so the common man does not know about blockchain and doesn't have to. But the capacities of the government to scale up. The capacity up of the government, so we have Jandan, Aadhaar, and mobile access. So my research was based on, so prior to joining the government, I wrote my thesis on roadblocks to the application of blockchain uh, in Indian agriculture. And it was a case study on Madhya Pradesh. And so I did like uh, groundwork in seven districts uh, in different agroeconomic zones in the state. And what I figured out is the understanding on Aadhaar, the understanding on mobile phone as far as SMS is, uh, is concerned, and uh, and the bank accounts. Jandan has done a tremendous job uh, in that regard. So all these three, the understanding of the masses, I think is good enough to start with something like a project of this, of this stature, to start with. In terms with. of infrastructure, does it entail a lot of investments uh, to yeah, spread blockchain? So um, not much. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, we thought it would be like a huge investment. But the current, so I, I'm sharing the details of DPR, but I think this is a platform where I can do that. Um, the current investment in revenue, for instance, would be somewhere around like 50 crores for a state like MP, which has 52 districts. I think it's okay. To make it blockchain compliant. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, when you have conclusive land titling. So I think that the amount of money you lose uh, because of the court cases and the pending court cases, and these court cases have been like there in the system for 20, 25 years. People have died and they But this couldn't is for blockchain specifically, you're saying, right? Uh, 50 crores. Yeah, okay. for, so for bringing your land details on blockchain, blockchain and yes. uh, distributing smart cards to the farmers, and so they'll have access to that private and public key, and then okay. they can, yeah. So that's not a big amount in terms of the program funding of thousands and thousands of crores getting pilfered and wasted. Sure, actually, yeah. Just if you can say a little bit on data privacy, uh, because as you said that this data can be used by, I mean, I just want to know about this. Uh, okay, so um, there was a recent judgment by the Supreme Court of India on Aadhaar. Uh, all, you, all of you must be aware about that. So uh, we won't be forcing masses to provide us the Aadhaar details. If the Aadhaar details are, so we can use identity markers as well, uh, except Aadhaar. So these identity markers could be they have ration cards, they have other sort of identity cards. If they want to give us voluntarily, then we can have, we cannot store Aadhaar, like any private player cannot store Aadhaar after, like for a particular, like after a particular period of time. So for like, imagine six months. So if they have access to Aadhaar for six months, that's it. Uh, they cannot keep Aadhaar in the system after that. But we can use identity markers. The key here is to use an identity marker so that we can figure out this is the person we are talking about. and. It's basically uh, something that could be used in welfare services. The state can decide, and there are privacy issues. Uh, I would agree with you on that. But the state can decide with whom to share that data and what kind of data has to be shared. So, so that is a policy matter, of course. Sure. Thanks, Nikhil. I think that's quite uh, informative. Because blockchain is something that many of us also are uh, you know, ignorant about in many respects. So. Uh, yeah, we move to, uh, since the theme is technology, so I'll finish with speakers of technology. Adhikas Jain, I think you've done a lot of work on surveillance and system systems, and how do we introduce that in our rural areas? Perhaps you could talk about that. Okay, well... Uh, or if there's something yeah, else yeah. that... I, I would like to continue this discussion uh, with our, my, my fellow colleagues. First of all, thank you for this opportunity to speak on the technology, how this is going for this, from smart city to smart villages. Basically, we talk too much about this smart city, means smart city means 100 numbers of smart city and all those things. Now this is coming to the smart villages. Now uh, my fellow, this uh, lady, Mari, Mari has mentioned some point that she has, she's been working for some villages in Haryana and she has pointed out that solarization of that sites or something like that. And then other uh, few more colleagues has pointed out that the solarization of those sites could bring some few benefits on those things. The, um, the basic thing is in, in, in the villages, or the 70% of the people, the population on India is still in the village. Now there is no electricity, no basic infrastructure even, no power, no last mile connectivity from the internet point of view or a few many, m more things. Now if solarization is one point where the electrification can bring, so solarization can be a microgrid kind of site. There are a few organizations which are working on the microgrid uh, concept. They are selling the power, they are making this uh, as a IoT enabled systems as even. But the thing here is, down the line, maybe f three years, four years, five years, because the ROI of this solarization of the microgrid is a, is a challenge. If they work on a CAPEX-based system or the OPEX-based system, OPEX-based system is one thing, the policy is not clear for the reason that if five years later, if the grid is there in the village, what to do with the solar? To take off the solar? Or what to, use, what to do with the solar? So that is the one policy need to work out. Even a uh, few forums I have attended. So uh, everyone touched upon this point, but still the, the, this is not clear that what to do with the solar or this concept. So this is one thing is the ROI point of view. Even somebody thinks about to put in the CapEx form and to, to get the return in the OPEX form is again a challenge because the payment, once they give the connection and all those things. So uh, there is no policy that everyone will bound 
to work with them with the three years, four years, or five years. So this is the one technology point which can bring the solar uh, electrification to the rural areas. But the policy is one challenge. Then second thing, uh, we, we talk about the, uh, the villages to be a powerization. Means we talk about the any city or any village. So people is there. I mean, the concept of city or the village is from the people who live there. They need the basic amenities, like uh, they need the power, they need uh, good sanitation, clean water, and all those things. So power brings more synergy to their life if the power comes to the system. Now, if power is one thing, so how the power becomes a smart power? My, uh, some of my uh, friends uh, say there that the power IoT enabled system is there. So power can be also IoT enabled. How this power can be IoT enabled? Every system which is installed in the, any village, any city, for any telecom or any application, any BBNL, Gram Panchayat application, if those systems are smart enough to capture the data from the point of their MTBF, means when, when their life will be over or when the preventive maintenance is needed, and auto alarming with the IoT enabled system. And it can measure the life, how much energy it has delivered, what, what is the energy sources available, how the energy source, what are the energy sources available, how to keep up of those energy sources, what is the life of the, uh, the switch gears used on those systems. If we keep up those things, could be make, make more significance to the smart powering, smart village, smartification of the villages. Now, there are many policies, many specifications, many uh, n number of things are there which talk about data. What to, means there are n number of data available. Everyone talks about too much data. But what to do with those data? Are we really going to address those data? We need to really see what is needed from that data. Do we need the similar data what we need for the smart city? Because there is no any firm specification or firm any, any guideline that there is the, the, the village which need to be as a, treated as a last mile connectivity. If we follow the same specification or same guidelines what we follow for the other smart cities and all those things, will they bring synergy to it? Or will they bring more cost to it and the, the, the overall cost will not be viable to put those solutions? That is very important point to think about it. Right, right. So I think, I think, and. On surveillance, uh, would you like to speak? Yeah, or? surveillance, actually, uh, surveillance, we did some project for the smart cities. We still yet to touch upon the smart villages for the surveillance. But on the surveillance side, we have developed a cost effective few solutions, which we are waiting for some good guidelines. Because when we talk about any smart village or anything, we again come up with the same specification what to be followed for the, uh, the, the smart cities and all. Even few smart cities which talk about the few guidelines which is for the, uh, the very higher capacity system which is still not viable to follow in the smart cities. So there has to be some guidelines, there has to be some uh, specification need to be revised based on the application actually. Because when we talk about the village, Village, every village, every city has its own problem. They, then it always need to work out that what is the optimum solution for that. Because if every village have their unique solution, then the cost optimization cannot reach. Because if we, 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 we duplicate the things so that we can use always the standard solutions, right. the standard so you're platform. You're talking about a template for smart, correct, smart correct. villages, yes, yes. which also includes aspects of surveillance and uh, longevity of equipment, correct, and correct, operational correct. maintenance, etc. Right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So I think that's just quite technology focused till now. The discussion it began with technology, so I thought I'll finish the technology speakers. But sustainability is more than technology as well. So how about governance and how do we ensure that our villages are empowered and they continue to? I mean, they're empowered enough and they're uh, literate enough to take forward these technologies, right? Something to the effect of what Mary also said, yeah. what from now on, like. Um, hello, good so afternoon. So Dr. Imran, sorry, Dr. Imran Amin is the Assistant Professor, Center for Development Practice, Ambedkar University, and he focuses on governance as practice, 
config governance and governmentality of development. So over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I, I was listening to everyone talking about technology and, and how, uh, whether it is uh, Ma Manus who is talking about how we have lost 60% of our uh, water bodies or uh, everybody else who was talking about how we are taking solar energy to the city, the villages, but when we have a village corridor somewhere, we have to think of it otherwise. One minister comes and says, uh, we are going to have electrification in this village and then that grid becomes redundant. Now, in all this, I think the first and the foremost thing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, technology that we need to keep in mind is we need to decentralize the very idea of knowledge. Uh, we need to look at villages, and that's where I, I wanted to make my first point, that villages are not smart, villages are. So uh, it's the villages that you have to, have to become smart, and that's where the story begins. To be able to do that, we, we need to balance between what we call experimental knowledge. So all kinds of technology come from research-based knowledge that has been experimented in a lab where you regulate your situations. You say, I put in two kgs of fertilizer on one acre of land, the productivity went up by one kg. On the other hand, there is experiential knowledge of those who actually do agriculture with, the, with those technology. Until unless you put both experimental and experiential knowledge on the same footing, it's not going to work. Your technology is not going to be adopted in the Manishra manner that, that you're looking at. And, and that's the point that he, he was saying, that we went so mad with hand pumps as a safe option for safe drinking water that we didn't think of the water table. Green Revolution didn't come with the intention that it's going to pollute our fo food chain, but it ended up doing that. Industrialization wasn't with the purpose of polluting the nature, but it ended up bringing climate change in our face, and right now that's the first question you have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a plan that you have. So um, that's the first thing that I would say, that for smart villages, you need smart villages who are able to democratize expertise. Expertise doesn't lie with people sitting here. It has also to go to the villagers who are actually putting it into practice, putting it as a piece of their livelihood. For me, I'm doing research on a project, but my livelihood is teaching. I get a salary from it. The person who will use my knowledge to do it, that's his livelihood. My information becomes his li source of livelihood. Whether it goes this way or that, it comes. The second thing that I would like to highlight would be deliberative communities. So it's not just that I have a model solution or a general solution, and I give it to the villagers, and they adopt it. Apart from being able to adopt them, they should also be able to adapt them to their own context and situation and where they are placed. And that's where you need deliberation. It's not just, I will accept solar lamp because solar energy is considered to be the solution. Does it really work in my village? Do I get that much of sunlight in a year? Absolutely. That becomes a critical question. So solar lamp works brilliantly when you are in the central part of India. Take it to the northern parts of India and the hilly regions, and suddenly your solar lamp solutions are not working or in the, the same manner. The rains are heavy. Uh, yeah. and, and that's where we, we need to start thinking a little more in terms of giving people that opportunity to say, no, this solution doesn't work for us, and not just passively accept everything. I think uh, Tanvi was speaking in the first uh, session who spoke about how we cannot be passive recipients. We have to actively engage with technologies that we are adopting, why we are adopting it, and how is it going to affect us in the long term. The third thing, the village, villages cannot be only producers of raw material and consumers of finished good. We have to bring the processing and value addition to the village. Mm. That's the only way it's going to work. If the person who is growing the cotton also produces the fabric and the cloth. Mm. If a person who is producing the grain also pl produces the flour in the village itself. If that doesn't happen, you're still looking at huge carbon footprints because of transport that won't leave these mm. things. And there is a very short margin of production that you will see going to the villages, and a larger margin of the profit going to everybody else who is involved in that processing sector. So until and unless you bring value addition and decentralize it to the village level, I, I don't think sustainability is going to work for us. So those are three points that I would like Thank to you say. Very much. I think it is sense. very, very well articulated. Uh, smart villagers rather than smart, not rather, along with smart villages. Yeah. 
So at last uh, but not the least, sorry for making you wait and thank you for your patience. Dr. L.C. Sharma, he's a managing director of Institute for Integrated Rural Development. Uh, since you work on holistic development, sir, I would give you the uh, you know, opportunity to summarize and then come up with what is the integrated solution to ensuring sustainability of rural areas, holistically. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, listening everyone's views here. And I have learned a lot out of this. Uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about the integration of uh, developmental practices, so, and sustainability along with it. Uh, after working in almost 21 states in the country for last almost 15 years plus, uh, we came to know that people in the villages are uh, having a lot of dreams to do. They want to do something big. They want to become a citizen of 21st century. But there is a critical gap that is of the information, gap is of the knowledge, and gap is of the skills. So we came up with uh, a solution which could bridge this gap of information, knowledge, and skills. We uh, launched a program that is called Mission Reeve, R-I-E-V. Here we all have been talking about uh, urbanizing villages, making villages smart, providing urban amenities in the villages. So it's more or less towards urbanization. But here our philosophy is a bit different. We are talking of ruralizing India. Half a hour urbanization has taken place immensely. We have destroyed the country actually. So we need to ruralize it. That is a different philosophy. We can uh, discuss different. How many Gram Panchayat Pradhans are here? Gram Panchayat Ke Pradhan Kitne Yahape Espak Bateve? Koi hai? Gram Panchayat Pradhan? I think they've left. Sare chalege. Okay. Uh, so, uh, under this mission reef, we have been uh, identifying needs of the people in the villages. This is a need assessment basically. We are enrolling families and we are making holistic need assessment of what are their worries, what are the struggles they have been uh, uh, doing, and what are the solutions they have been looking for. This comes through a te technological uh, platform, this uh, uh, like robust, uh, I mean, uh, software developed for this. Need assessment is done, and thereafter, uh, we are engaging uh, three to 10 people from the native panchayat to serve the people of the same panchayat only. The solutions, the customized solutions are offered to the people. It is not only in the shape of advice, we are advising the people do like this and that, not like this, but we, the people engaged in the villages, are getting the things done on behalf of the people for them. This is in terms of agriculture, health, education, rural produce marketing, banking and finance, business development and uh, entrepreneurship, uh, social security, land and property management. There are 10 service divisions which have uh, been uh, institutionalized. And the holistic services are provided. For example, in the case of health, we don't have, uh, we have piloted the, this concept in, in Himachal Pradesh, uh, covering 3,226 gram panchayats and uh, providing initially employment for around 10,000 people, which by end of this year is likely to increase to 35,000 people in a single state of Himachal Pradesh, and that too without getting a single rupee support from any uh, government or non-government agencies. Because this is self-sustainable model, we have been selling the services to the communities. The communities, wherever they are spending, uh, for example, 6,000 rupees for getting a particular service done from any source by spending three months, that service we are giving to them within 10, 15 days for 500 rupees, 700 rupees. And the revenue being collected from the people, from the community, is sustaining the livelihood of the people who are engaged there. That is 10,000 people as of now, and 35,000 people by end of this year, that is vision. So here, uh, what we noticed is around 30% people who had migrated to different metros for their livelihood shown interest to come back to the roots. And we experienced 30% reverse migration. That is the beauty of this uh, program. People from the cities came back to the city, uh, villages. They started working there. Because this is uh, the model of 
cost based service low, low cost based service so whatever the services are needed by the people irrespective of the dimension of the problem magnitude intensity uh, frequency of the service needed so all kind of the services are being provided to them a back ended service support mechanism has been devised uh, for example in case of health we don't have health infrastructure available in the hill states so our people will go to the village they will take the sample and mobile laboratory will go all their uh, diagnostic tests will be there and through our telemedicine uh, uh, application the data will come to our expert doctor will be able to see uh, the parameters of the test and we are in the process of setting up 300 generic medicine outlets also 15 are established so far in partnership with the bppi government of india in himachal pradesh so the low cost medicines are taken from the generic medicine outlet and supplied through bus to the village and our facilitator in the village they collect the medicines from the bus and ensure that that is delivered to the patients and periodically it is monitored and followed up also same in case of agriculture right from soil test providing organic manure pesticides treated seeds and the uh, uh, technical support uh, for uh, uh, growing the crop and then linkages establishing linkages with the marketing uh, agencies also so that they get right and premium price for their produce promoting organic similarly and uh, somebody wants to set up some uh, in enterprise in the villages some entrepreneurship uh, programs so right from designing a uh, program for him training Uh, project proposal linkages with the bank getting the loan sanction for the bank and uh, getting all the uh, regulatory uh, licenses uh, registration and uh, uh, nocs done from the regulatory authorities and then providing mentoring support complete during the year for a uh, for one year period so that he doesn't roll back so these are the services holistic services being provided being piloted in a single state of himachal pradesh Uh, which has uh, it is going to become a boon to the people of the state and once it is successfully piloted uh, in the single state we would like to replicate these practices uh, throughout the country also and there is a potential to create employment opportunity to uh, around 1 crore people uh, without any one support self sustainable model a way in the country so this is missionary done by this is missionary we have been doing yeah. no it is not the government is doing it okay. we have been doing it as iid has been doing it so so when we talk about the sustainability one is that we need to integrate develop, uh, various aspects of development together we cannot talk of only water and uh, leaving the agriculture behind we cannot talk of education leaving the health behind we have to integrate the developmental aspects then only holistic development will uh, take place second sustainability doesn't come until there is uh, institutional uh, framework in place which works in a business model so that is Uh, we came up with uh, by selling the services to the people so that we do not need to depend upon external sources uh, or some grant some funding some government or non government support for this it is the people on the initiative people have been uh, asking for the support system we came up with the low cost and low time investment uh, uh, service model to the people so it has been owned by the people now they are ready to pay where they are spending 10000 rupees they are getting the service for 1000 rupees they are saving the money also they are saving their time also and whatever the developmental initiatives they want to take they are able to take up all such initiatives within the time so that the pace of progress is accelerating this is by way we are trying to make the villages as vibrant uh, centers of the rural right, economy right Thank very you. interesting i think holistic uh, chain is what you're saying right uh, self sustaining value chain across various domains right so uh, i think i'll thank all the speakers it's quite late already so uh, uh, excuse me so i, uh, I, I probably didn't get the chance to oh, speak okay i thought right. you spoke already and so uh, 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 yeah I, I answered the questions yeah. right. I have come all oh, the way. Yeah, yeah. Evening yeah. work. Right. So uh, on sustainability, I have a few points, uh, and I want certain uh, thoughts on what other speakers have also said. So uh, there are uh, two eyes that I say. One is infrastructure, and one is institution, as sir has spoken about. That remains for some time, right? So. these are two things that uh, i see as so uh, sustainability of multi is of multiple uh, uh, par, uh, uh, fashion so one is environmental sustainability that the team has already spoken about uh, 
then sustain continuance of your development that sort of sustainability uh, i want to emphasize about how how do we bring that out so infrastructure can be of multiple uh, uh, part so a is the physical infrastructure that that uh, can be created for the villages that remains for some time although maintenance of that needs to be looked at then there is this uh, infrastructure things like what uh, nikhil is making this data infrastructure so this sort of infrastructure hard things need to needs to be created that on which uh, a, a long term uh, development of the village is based on right so a similar thing that hcl foundation is doing is uh, we are creating these maps and these uh, uh, household uh, gis codes and addressing of these household which which we will give back to the government on which that the whole data infrastructure of the uh, village for future can be put on so this is uh, one point that i want to uh, bring in and second point is this infist institutional infrastructure that uh, that sir has spoken spoken about is very essential so sgs are created then farmer producer organizations and user groups that are created in our work which which can own this infrastructure and maintain so this is uh, our thought on uh, how uh, sustainability can be plus there needs to be planning a long term planning as as uh, uh, one of the panelists spoke about that uh, uh, if uh, so all foundations and other development organization needs to have term plan uh, uh, for the whole uh, uh, the 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 region that that development is and then only they'll be able to think about the negative effects of their work and 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 bring uh uh, uh a better uh, understanding and thought about uh, uh, uh development sure thanks we oh, sorry i uh, missed out on your thing so he spoke of uh, something which others haven't spoken is about the planning aspect uh that you need to have a plan and a vision and then you uh you plan for your sustainable elements and about the self help groups i think others didn't touch upon that that you could really tap on self help groups and our farmer producer organizations as well to add on to that to ensure sustainability of our systems and uh, processes that we introduce so i uh, like to thank all the panelists and before we conclude today's uh, track this is the end of the track i'll just quickly summarize the entire uh, track that happened today so we started with uh, oh you have the innovator yeah. uh, sorry uh, so before i uh, conclude the track uh, we have the innovator abhinav uh, abhinav goswami please uh, come on to stage yeah. hi uh, thanks for the opportunity Uh, I came from a village called Jarara in Aligarh district. Uh, basically, I am a data scientist and very happy that the way he spoke about it, uh, the blockchain methods and all that. On that, so I've been in 20 years into corporate uh, uh, sector, uh, 10 years in India, and then 10 years in USA. Worked for uh, Royal Bank of Scotland and then to Apple Corporation in Cupertino, California. Two years back, uh, life changed, and uh, the whole family moved to the village. now what we do here in the village and i hope everybody understands hindi i'll speak in it uh, because we are not speaking cupertino now to gaon mein aage 2 saal pehle uddesh ye tha ki mere jeevan mein jo parivartan aaya hai gaon se uthke apple tak jaane mein to kisi aur bacche mein wo parivartan kaise aaye how do we make that success sustainable और फॉर उसका मॉडल बनाने के लिए एक विचार उठा कि एक ऐसा सेल्फ सस्टेनेबल एजुकेशन सिस्टम हो जहाँ बच्चे को आप किताबी ज्ञान के साथ साथ आ, उसको स्किल भी दीजिए उसको ज्ञान दीजिए उसको विचार दीजिए तो वो विचार लेके हम गांव आ गए अब वो सिस्टम बच्चे को आप जब लाओगे तो उसका खाना पीना रहना सहना ये सारा हमें इंतजाम करना पड़ेगा तो वो भी सिस्टम कैसे सेल्फ सस्टेनेबल हो तो उसके लिए हमने एक काव बेस्ड रूरल इको डेवलप किया है और वॉट वी आर डूइंग नाउ हमारे सेंटर में गाय हैं देसी गाय हैं देसी गाय का हम गोबर गौमूत्र लेते हैं उसको बायोडाइजेस्टर में डालते हैं वहाँ से मीथेन क्रिएट करते हैं उस मीथेन से हम अपनी फ्यूल की सारी रिक्वायरमेंट और उसी से बिजली बना लेते हैं तो 30 किलोवाट बिजली थ्री फेज़ फॉर 40 वोल्ट विच इज़ इंडस्ट्रियल लेवल पावर माने कि 
आपको बिजली के लिए किसी ग्रिड पे या किसी अपना मिनी ग्रिड की ज़रूरत नहीं है हमें जब हमें बिजली चाहिए प्रोसेसिंग के लिए कर लेते हैं वहीं पे प्रोसेसिंग यूनिट लगाई हुई है मिल्क प्रोसेसिंग यूनिट बाकी जो स्लरी निकलती है उसको फिर हम अर्थवम्स को दे देते हैं तो अर्थवम्स से हमको वर्मी कम्पोस्ट मिल गया वर्मी कम्पोस्ट हमने धरती में दे दिया अपने खेतों में तीस एकड़ ज़मीन हम करते हैं ऑल ऑर्गेनिक और तो आप देखिए कि हमारे यहाँ पे केमिकल पेस्टिसाइड और एनी हार्मफुल थिंग इज़ बैंड कम्प्लीटली गायों का चारा भी ऑर्गेनिक हो गया तो ये पूरा इकोसिस्टम बन गया गाय का चारा ऑर्गेनिक आया गाय ने चारा खाया गोबर गौमूत्र दिया फिर गैस बन गई फिर बिजली बन गई फिर वर्मी कम्पोज बन गया तो ये पूरा रेप्लीकेबल सिस्टम है ये किसी भी गाँव में चलेगा इसके साइड इफेक्ट कह लो या एडवांटेज लॉर्ड ऑफ रूरल एम्प्लॉयमेंट बींग क्रिएटेड जैसे समबडी वॉज एक्सप्लेनिंग कि रिवर्स माइग्रेशन है तो मेरे फार्म पे जो लोग हैं दे आर द पीपल हुए वर्क इन नोएडा इन फरीदाबाद इन फैक्ट्रीज एंड नाउ दे आर कमिंग बैक कि भैया वी मेक दैट मच मनी इन योर फार्म इट सेल्फ सो वाई वुड बी गो टू उसमें तो कहने का मतलब ये है कि हम गांव की समस्या को देख के अगर इनोवेशन की बात करेंगे अगर सस्टेनेबिलिटी की बात करेंगे यूज अपॉर्चुनिटी इन दिस कंट्री टेक्नोलॉजी के लिए मुझे लगता है कि गवर्नमेंट पर डिपेंडेंसी होने के बजाय फार्मर के लिए टेक्नोलॉजी बनाइए दुर्भाग्य इस देश का ये है कि आज तक इतनी आई आई टीज आई आई एम होने के बावजूद ये देश किसान के लिए हल को डेवलप नहीं कर पाया हल का मतलब सोल्यूशन हल का मतलब जो एक फाली का हल होता था पहले एक फाली का होता था जो गांव से वो जानते होंगे इतनी आई आई टी होने के बाद हमने ट्रेलर तो लगा दिया ट्रैक्टर तो लगा दिया जो कि सेल्फ सस्टेनेबल नहीं है फार्मर आज का फार्मर शहर वाले की तो मजबूरी है आज का फार्मर भी कॉरपोरेट के लिए अपना पसीना बहा रहा है उसको ट्रैक्टर का ट्रैक्टर की किस्त देनी है उसको टेलर की किश्त देनी है उसको बिजली वाले का पैसा माने व्हाट डिड वी डू एज अ कंट्री टू दैट फार्मर आई डोंट थिंक तो मैं किसान का बच्चा हूँ इसलिए मुझे वो दर्द पता है बचपन में हम दो बैल होते थे एक एक हल जोतते थे अपना तो होना ये चाहिए था कि दो बैल की जगह चार बैल हो जाते दस हो जाते एक फाली की जगह दस फाली का टेलर हो जाता तो ट्रैक्टर की हिम्मत ही नहीं थी उसके सामने आने की बिकॉज बोले एनर्जी इज द कॉन्सेप्ट इन दिस कंट्री so there are lot of things to discuss but what i i want to say that uh, at least there is a discussion on smart villages on on better ways of doing on energy and all that uh, we have developed a model jahan se aapko food bhi mil raha hai aapko acha acha environment mil raha hai aapko ab is saal hum gurukul sthapna karne ki lage hue hain so this year we will start the education as well where kids will have all the opportunity to learn all the best knowledge in the world uh, without any expense they don't have to pay iski jo economy hai 200 gayon ka jo hamara model humne banaya hai usme lagbhag 4 crore rupaye hum generate karenge as a revenue us 4 crore mein 55% 50% hum operational expense nikal de to baki sara paisa 200 250 bachcho ki padhai ke liye aap kharch kar sakte hain pone 2 2 crore rupaye यानी कि मुझे किसी भी माँ बाप से पैसे मांगने की ज़रूरत नहीं है वन टाइम सेटअप कॉस्ट आएगी वो हम दोस्तों से ले लेंगे अपना कुछ पैसा लगा देंगे तो इस देश का भविष्य ये देश हमेशा दान पे पीछे ही चला था हम बीच में थोड़ा गड़बड़ हो गए थे कि हम स्वार्थ में घुस गए हैं लेकिन आ, हम पुनः उस चीज़ पर आ रहे हैं अमेरिका का डॉलर मुझे नहीं रोक पाया बहुत कोशिश की तीन महीने इसी बात पर लगाए कि भाई तू छोड़ के क्यों जा रहा है और तू गाँव क्यों जा रहा है समझ आ गया तो उनको बता दिया भाई डिजायर लेस एक्शन में जा रहा हूँ निष्काम भाव में जा रहा हूँ तो थैंक यू फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड आई लाइक द सेशन आई वुड लव टू गेट सम ऑफ द टेक्नोलॉजी हेल्प ऑन माय फार्म इट सेल्फ स्पेशली इन द ब्लॉकचेन मेथड्स की इफ आई कुड रजिस्टर एवरी आई प्रोड्यूस ऑन द फार्म आई जनरेट लॉर्ड ऑफ डेटा आप जो फूड खा रहे हो अगर उसको मैं ट्रेस कर पाऊँ कहाँ से होगा कब चला कैसे हुआ तो मुझे किसी सर्टिफिकेशन की जरूरत नहीं है कि भैया ये ऑर्गेनिक है कि नहीं है आई सिंपली विल से क्लिक इट एंड यू सी इट यू कैन सी योर फूड ग्रोइंग राइट ऑन द फार्म तो ऐसी ऐसे में आई वुड लव टू गेट सम सपोर्ट फ्रॉम द पीपल हियर आई ओ टी आई एम ऑल ओपन फॉर इट एक किलो गाय के गोबर से कितनी गैस बनती है मैंने एस्टिमेट किया है बीस ग्राम बनती है लेकिन आप बता दो कि नहीं बीस पॉइंट फाइव ग्राम बनती है तो आई विल बी हैप्पी और हर घर में गाय है हर घर में पशु है हर घर में गोबर है पूरा गांव सेल्फ सस्टेनेबल हो सकता है जो गैस की रिक्वायरमेंट है शहर वालों को लेने दीजिए एलपीजी का सिलेंडर हम लोग अपनी खुद बना लेंगे
इसमें क्या दिक्कत है द साइट इज बींग डेवलप्ड एज अ टूरिस्ट डेस्टिनेशन ऑल्सो प्रटी सुन वी विल ओपन इट एज अू नो पीपल कैन कम स्टे ओवर नाइट एंड एंजॉय द होल एटमोसफेयर इट्स अबाउट टू आवर फ्रॉम हियर इन अलीगढ़ चरार विलेज थैंक यू सो मचेजेस टू आर सिटीज राइट so uh, yeah very interesting case studies isolated case studies in india probably we collect all that document that and replicate it across the country that will solve most of the problems so quickly summarize the conclave uh, the in the conference uh, these began with programs and policies of uh, you know government of india urban mission and what are the challenges and bottlenecks faced uh, especially with interdepartmental convergence and then we heard from madhya pradesh uh, it department i mean the agency for information technology how a technology could be used to actually establish synergies between various departments and director tanvi she spoke about how she's actually done it in madhya pradesh right uh, very innovative solutions of uh, synergizing various departments through technology then we had dr amitabh kundu speaking he's an expert uh, statistician as well as an intellect uh, leading intellectual of the country and he spoke about Mm, he actually gave us some uh, interesting statistics uh, he spoke about how india's uh, growth rate is actually above the global average growth rate but at the same time there are certain dichotomies in terms of the urban rural disparities in um, employment and economy etc and uh, surprisingly rural employment is higher than urban employment but the poverty rates are uh, higher in rural areas so that's again a paradox of sorts and uh, yeah so after that i think we uh, we had hcl foundation we listened to their uh, examples of um, uh, again missions in in pilot modes you know how they've integrated rural development through their uh, csr initiatives but i think the difference between the government and the private sector is the private sector when they get involved it's their money so they see that every penny is spent wisely so and uh, then we moved on to our uh, sarpanches so we had a very interesting session with sarpanches it was extremely inspiring to hear the grassroots level stories of the sarpanches and how they've actually taken leadership initiatives of their own and uh, transformed their villages so those can be good case studies to be documented and replicated then of course we had a session on csr and interesting takeaways from the csr session was that Uh, foundations and corporates are very clear that they don't want any government interference or regulation <laughs> so no government and uh, the east is east and west is west as what came out uh, but at the same time we need to look at how what csr activities are going on across the country document them and understand what each foundation is doing and perhaps not replicate that in the same area uh, yeah and of course we had a vibrant student who dynamic student who was there as part of the panel and he was very uh, Uh, you know frustrated about how corporates don't take students seriously while actually his uh, uh, unit was actually doing a lot of csr activities uh, in terms of actually involving women in um, their um, csr activities etc and so that's a lesson for us is not to take anybody uh, lightly you know even if it's students so they have a lot to contribute and uh, of course the last session was this uh, very very heavy session of technologies and how we could ensure sustainability of technologies uh, in terms of solar renewable how to restore our traditional uh, systems of water and other systems and also how we could use blockchain which is quite uh, new uh, technology as far as india's concerned how it could actually take things forward and ensure uh, sustainability of um, uh, like it would also ensure geographical indication and things like that right and uh, of course we heard from governance experts of how we could ensure uh, how we could actually make smart villagers instead of smart villages which is so important to so that they carry forward these sustainable solutions and from san moksha as well but how uh, micro grids need to be integrated into our policies and of course uh, iit's uh, integrated holistic uh, development of uh, villages initiatives taken in himachal pradesh is uh, really noteworthy so i think it was very interesting uh, conclave and learned a lot i hope we come out with some kind of a white paper from this we would perhaps okay thank you thank you very much thank you all yeah thank you hello yeah thank you so much thank you speakers and a very 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 special thanks to ms vinita hariharan she's been sitting here from la from 2 pm
and we thank you, ma'am, for your patience. Uh, something that, as a layman, I have taken back today is uh, smart villages. Uh, yes, the people say that there has been, uh, there is a huge difference between rural and urban, but I don't think so. I believe villages are getting there for sure. I would uh, request um, uh, Ms. Vinita Hariharan to kindly felicitate our fellow speakers. One big round of applause, please, for everyone. Dr. Imran Amin, Associate Professor, Center for Development Practice, Ambedkar University, Delhi, India. Mr. Atul Bhatnagar, Business Advisor, Sun Moksh, India. Mr. Webhav Chauhan, Project Manager, HCL Foundation. Mr. Saurabh Chaudhary, Associate Counselor, IGBC, India. Oh, sorry. Mr. Nikhil Manohar Dube, Associate Director, Madhya Pradesh Agency for Promotion of Information Technology, India. Mr. Vikas Jain, AGM, Product, Product Management, Delta Electronics, India. Mr. Manish Pathak, Envirepreneur, 3R Management, Private Limited, India. Dr. L.C. Sharma, Managing Director, IIRD, India. Ms. Mari Helene Zera, Research Director, Center for Policy Research, India. And a special one for our innovator, sir. I request you to come on uh, stage. Mr. Abhinav Goswami, Village uh, Jarara. I would request you all to please stand for the group picture, please. 